ideas worth spreading. But how do you know which ideas are worth spreading to your hometown? Imagine that you're the mayor of your city, and you have two priority areas. You're worried about kids in the schools who have fallen behind, and you want to find ways to help them catch up. And there are also members of the community who are having a hard time taking basic steps to stay healthy. How can you best support them? So where do you start? Often our first instinct is to look at what worked somewhere else. So your team starts combing through evidence from scientific experiments that can pinpoint whether a specific program that was tried somewhere else worked or not. But then you face a problem. Because how can you actually know whether something that worked somewhere else is also going to work for you? To answer this, I used to ask the wrong questions. It's tempting to focus on geography. Was it tested nearby? But how near is near enough if it was tested in the same state, the same country, the same continent? And then the arguments start. Can you really teach math here the way they do in Singapore? And can you really import health programs from Scandinavia and expect the same effect? And these kinds of questions often lead to a hopeless conclusion, because nowhere is identical to here. And so what do we do? Do we have to start from scratch every time? Can we not learn from ideas that were effective in other places? These are exactly the kinds of questions that I focus on in my work at the Poverty Action Lab at MIT. And the question shouldn't be, where did this idea come from, but why did it work? What underlying lesson about human behavior did this idea teach us? And what can we learn, not about place, but about people? So instead of asking, what's the same about place, I want you to ask, what's the same about people? So let's take a step back and unpack two examples that dramatically improved lives and examine how human behavior changed. There's an economist at the University of Chicago named Richard Thaler, and he just won a Nobel Prize for his work on human behavior. One of his biggest insights, people like to procrastinate. I can see a lot of guilty smiles right now. You're remembering something that you put off yesterday. But this isn't just trivial. When we're thinking about how we can tackle some of the most important problems in the world, procrastination can really matter. It can mean the difference between a healthy child and a very sick child. We know that immunization is one of the most cost-effective ways to save a child's life. But even in areas of the world where immunizations are available and free, Many children aren't being fully immunized. So let's go to Udaipur. It's in the Indian state of Rajasthan. And when our lab was working there a decade ago, more than 95% of the children were missing some or all of their shots. Why? Was it because they were too expensive? No, the shots were available and free. And when children did get sick, their parents would take them to the doctor and spend a lot of money on medical care. So maybe it was a different problem. Maybe it was going from intention to action, finding the time to walk to the clinic with your child to have them immunized. And maybe when you get there, the nurse is out, so you have to come back another day. And you decide, you know, I'll get around to this soon, but you put it off, and eventually you miss the window. And if that's what's actually going on, maybe we can give you a reason to stop putting it off. So we tested this idea with a randomized evaluation, which is the same method that we use in experiments to test new medical treatments. And we worked with a local NGO called Seva Mendir, and they've been working in Udaipur for 50 years and really understand the local context. So we worked with them to test this idea across 134 villages in Udaipur. And in the first group of villages, we held these reoccurring immunization camps where parents could bring their children to be immunized, and they knew a nurse was going to be there that day. And then in the second group of villages, we held those same immunization camps, but also gave parents one kilo of lentils every time they came. 
And then the third group of villages was the comparison group, where it was business as usual. Now, if I really don't want to get my child immunized, a small bag of lentils isn't going to change my mind. But if I just need a reason to remember to go to the clinic today instead of tomorrow, I might remember to do that, to get that kilo of lentils. And it turned out that that worked really well. So let's see what happened. So here we have the business as usual group, where only 6% of the children in those villages were fully immunized. And when we added these reoccurring immunization camps, it really helped. But when we also added the lentils, more than six times as many children were fully immunized. And you might be thinking, well, but it's expensive to hand out these lentils. Can we do this all the time? And it turned out that actually the cost per shot in the villages where we handed out the lentils was lower because those immunization camps were so much busier. So we found a way to overcome the problem of procrastination. It's a very simple problem, but one that all of us share. And six times as many children were fully immunized. Now, how would you decide whether to try this incentives for immunization idea somewhere new? What questions would you ask? And the question isn't, do people also eat lentils there? We can swap out the lentils for something else. And in fact, we're currently trying this with mobile phone credits in Pakistan and with a local favorite peanut butter and cereal in Sierra Leone. The question is just, do parents need a reason to bring their child to be immunized today instead of tomorrow? And this works for more than just immunizations, whether it's a nudge to quit smoking or to remember to treat your water so it's safe to drink. We've repeatedly seen that tiny incentives can really help people act today instead of tomorrow all around the world. So when we focus on this underlying reason for why behavior changed, it can help us better answer that question of whether a program might work for you wherever you are. So now let's look at another example where there was a common problem across very different contexts, but we found a solution that held. We learn best when we're taught at our level. That sounds obvious, right? But it's not the reality that a lot of students face in school. So here's an example of what 10th grade kids learn in school. And now I'm going to show you some problems that we've seen students in those same 10th grade classrooms not be able to solve. Now I want you to imagine sitting in a classroom day after day, trying to tackle multivariable algebra, when you're still struggling with basic addition. And some people have looked at this gap and, and drawn a pretty hopeless conclusion and said, you know, if the children are so far behind in high school, is it just too late? And the truth is that most of the programs that we've rig rigorously evaluated for vulnerable students in high school don't move the needle in terms of learning. But what if the problem isn't that students who have fallen so far behind can't learn? And it's not that teachers in struggling classrooms can't teach. It's a mismatch. It's a mismatch between what students are expected to learn and the level that they're actually at. And it turns out that there's straightforward, effective ways to address that mismatch. For this one, we're going to come back here to Boston. And there's a school over on Commonwealth Avenue called Match Public Charter School. And it's been recognized as one of the top high schools in the country. One of their founding principles is individualized tutoring. So students spend time every day, either individually or in small groups with a tutor, working on skills at their own level and at their own pace. And when we learned about this approach, we were really interested in it because we've seen similar approaches work in other parts of the world in a concept we call teaching at the right level. So for example, in Kenya, we found that when students were grouped into classes based on their initial learning levels, instead of by age or by grade, students in all of the groups learned better. And in India, we've worked with a prominent NGO called Pratham, and they enlist local volunteers to tutor students, young children, in basic reading and math skills. 
And kids who had fallen years behind the curriculum started catching up very quickly. And we worked with them to test this in different settings, rural and urban, during the school day, during summer break, with volunteers, with government teachers, and consistently the results were positive across the board. So when our education lab colleagues were working with the Chicago public schools, they thought that a version of teaching at the right level might be a good fit for helping high school boys who had fallen years behind the curriculum. Because there was a common problem across Kenya and India and Chicago. Students were attending school, they had fallen far behind, but their teachers faced incentives to teach grade level material, not the basic skills that some of their students were still struggling with. So Chicago decided to try out Match's targeting, targeted tutoring model together with a nonprofit called Saga Innovations. And they provided two on one intensive tutoring in math for boys who had fallen years behind in math. And it really worked. The boys who received tutoring learned almost two extra years of math in a single year. And it wasn't just math that improved. They were less likely to fail other courses and less likely to be arrested for a violent crime. And these are some of the biggest learning gains that we've seen for programs aimed at helping disadvantaged high school students. So across Kenya and India, Chicago and Boston, when students were taught at their level, they caught up. That's not groundbreaking, but it's simple and it's effective. And we've seen it work across radically different contexts. Now, am I suggesting that every single school in the world should implement a targeted tutoring program? Not necessarily. But if we get stuck on location and think that Chicago can't learn from India, we'll miss out on a lot of great ideas. And if we focus so much on location and think that, you know, oh, food incentives weren't practical in Pakistan and lentils weren't the right food in Sierra Leone, we'd miss out on the chance to try something that did make sense locally, like mobile phone credits or peanut butter. There are a lot of ideas worth spreading. And when we ask why people change their behavior, why they act the way they do, we can look across superficial differences in geography and learn from surprising places. And we can learn from surprising places when we stop focusing too much on place and start thinking about people. Thank you.